the first um, in person talk. Start up. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike. Welcome to the first INC Chopped Up, hybrid INC Chopped Up ever, and the first um, in person INC event since the pandemic started. Uh, I'm Mike. This is Claudia. Um, I've seen Silly for me to introduce her because she's been around way longer than I have, and we have a much higher likelihood of knowing her than knowing me. She's been here since 2010, she's been working with uh, Terry Sosnowski, and she's going to be presenting a, um, uh, an, an, an analysis technique she developed as a graduate student and has since been applying to um, neural data. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So um, this talk is about DDA, the data from two analysis. Everybody who knows me knows this term already. So the outline of the talk first we will introduce what DDA is, and then I will show you how to apply it to FFC data. So the idea comes from the idea comes from nonlinear dynamics. You have an unknown dynamic system. Uh, Okay, I just okay. So, so you have an unknown dynamic system, um, which could be the brain. This is highly nonlinear, highly complex. You cannot record everything, but you can record EEG data. And here's a time series of EEG data. So, um, you want to get information out of this and also the nonlinear information contained in the data. So there's this two core embedding theorems by Parkins that tell you that if we create an embedding, then we can have insight into the um, insight into the dynamics of the original dynamic system without recording all the variables. So there's two two different ways of uh, of embeddings. There is a differential embedding where we take the time series and the derivative of the time series. And then you get this pattern. So this is from this segment of the data. And then you can also create. Is it Okay, also you can have a, this, yeah, okay. Oopsie, but then, then this goes to the next page. Okay, um, you can also have a delay, a delay embedding where you take the time series and a delayed version of the, um, of the time series and create also a phase space. So these two patterns look very similar and the idea of DDA is to combine them. So this is a delay differential equation where you have on the left side the derivative and on the right side you have the delayed versions of the signal. So x sub one is x of t minus tau one. You have two delays in this equation and the two delays are independent from each other. So this is not a traditional embedding. It's a non-uniform embedding. And then you have also a quadratic term. So you have also quadratic versions of the embedding. Um, the embedded, embedded signal. Okay, um, so to give you a little bit of an idea how such an embedding looks for a signal, this is somebody um, saying the word iris, and here you have just the sound signal, and on the right side you have the embedding. And if you, if you move this signal through the, through the sound, then sometimes you will see really regular patterns. And sometimes you see other patterns. So the idea is each of the sounds have their distinct patterns. And the last part of the signal here is the word S, which is very similar to Gaussian noise. But the background noise just looks also different than this, the embedding of S. So if you apply the same as to speech, to brain data, you can get some information out from this brain data. So DDA is done in the time domain and not in the spectral domain. You have on the left side, the differential embedding, on the right side, the delay embedding. Um, we use very sparse models of only three terms. And 
we then estimate from, uh, so the delays are fixed, the, the model does not update. It's just, there's one model that is fixed and you uh, get the coefficients, A1, A2, A3, and the model error. So you can have the fitting error from the left and right side um, to identify dynamical differences in the data. So I do not do pre-processing. I do not filter noise out, um, but I only normalize to zero mean and unit variance of each data window. So I throw out amplitude and concentrate on the dynamics. Um, to estimate these coefficients is a linear fit, so it's fast. It can also work on short time series because you have a really smart model. Um, this small feature space, um, is an advantage because you reduce the risk of overfitting and it's noise insensitive because such a small model cannot concentrate on noise. It models the dynamics of the data. So I applied it to all kinds of EEG data, um, to epilepsy, sleep, schizophrenia, and also Parkinson's data. For the Parkinson's data, I also had movement data on top of it. Um, I applied it to heart data to distinguish between different heart conditions, normal heart, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation. Um, I also applied it to see the emotions in speech and to or, uh, dolphin echolocation where the dolphins um, from the submarine base in San Diego had to find different targets. So how can you distinguish between the different targets? So if you wonder what connections also, I introduced DDA as a nonlinear tool from embeddings, but you can also see it as a very sparse Volterra series. So this is a Volterra series, but you have also on the left side the derivative on the right side, you have all the delayed versions up to very high nonlinearities. So the DDA model, you can write it in a very compact form like this. Again, the model I had up before. So I reduce, uh, re reduce my analysis to uh, two, two delays and three terms, and the order of nonlinearity is always smaller than four. That proved well, that proved good in the past, so I'm just going with that. There's also a connection to frequencies. So yeah, if I have a delayed differential equation with just one linear term, then the, um, the coefficient A is proportional to the frequency and the delay is inverse proportional to frequency. But as soon as you have one nonlinear term in, in the equation, then there is no connection to frequencies at all. But the co coefficient is only non-zero for signals without frequency, with um, with frequency couplings. So as, as long as you have a nonlinear signal, you have also this nonlinear terms non-zero. So I will show you now the Southern Californian flavors of DDA. I say the Southern Californian flavors of DDA because um, there is also in Austria DNA DDA. So it's in Austria, it's, it's applied to genetics. Here, we concentrate on EG data. So um, if I say single trial DDA, I always mean single trial or single channel DDA. When I first named it single trial DDA, I was working on ERP data on different trials and the name made sense. I'm just sticking with it. So always bear in mind, single trial and single channel is the same. The same for cross trial or cross channel. So let's just start with a signal. So we have a, a segment of EEG data. Then we have the equation as we had it before. So green is the signal. I need to compute the derivative of the signal numerically. Um, I do that with weighted center derivative. Then I have again the same signal because here I have the same signal. And then I have the signal just squared. Then I apply the delays. So I have tau one and tau two. And then I have a data window. So this is the data window I'm using. And then I just simply slide my data window over the data and compute my coefficients A1, A2, A3, and the model error row and use those as features. 
I can also write this equation in a more compact form. So here in this, in this data window, I have L points. So I can write this as a vector of this L derivatives. The green data segment is delayed by tau one. The blue data segment is delayed by tau two. And the purple uh, data segment is delayed by tau one again, but it's the squared version. And then I have here my coefficients. So I can write it in a matrix form, very compact. U dot is this matrix M times the features A. For cross trial DDA, for example, if I would take two time series, I just stack this, um, these derivatives like Legos on top of each other. And the same I do with the matrix. So I have the red matrix, which you just saw in the, in the previous slide. And then I have for a second time series, U2, I have the blue matrix. So again, I just stick, stack these matrices on top of each other, just do Lego. And then I have my coefficients B1, B2, B3. So I can, yes? Can you comment please on how you choose star one and star two? It will come. Yeah. So, um, so I can do this for two time series, three time series or more time series to compute these coefficients. Um, the advantage is I have more data to compute the coefficients from in one step, instead of taking uh, just a single trial DDA and then take the mean. But of course there's limitations and I will get to those as well. So here is the single trial DDA again. You have one time series, you have this little equation. For cross trial, you have this um, derivative Legos, you have the matrix Legos, and you have your coefficients B. This only works if the time series have the same dynamical information. So if the, in this time series here, there is different dynamical information, then it doesn't make sense. But to check if there is the same dynamic information in all the time series, I am using dynamic ergodicity DDA. So ergodicity in physics means you have particles and you can follow one particle for a long time, or you have multiple particles and take the space average over those. And if those are the same, then the system is ergodic. Here I borrow this term ergodicity and define dynamic ergodicity. Uh, and I say, if the mean of the single trials is similar to the cross trial, then, the, then you have the same dynamics in this time series. So, how, uh, so there is also a connection to frequency analysis. So I also develop cross trial frequency analysis. I will not go into detail, but I thought it would be nice to show that here as well. So in this paper I published in 2015 with Terry, we looked at um, 20 signals, just 20 trials um, of phase coherent time series, which just here is, uh, you have frequency and phase coupling in here and you have three single frequencies. If I take the mean, of course, I see everything nicely. If I do the wave flats, all the frequencies come out. Single trial frequency analysis, everything is beautiful and the cross trial is also beautiful. But if you take 20 phase incoherent time series, if you take the mean, you don't see anything here. The wavelet analysis doesn't look very nice, not like the wavelets here. The single trial frequency analysis also looks even more crappy than the wavelet analysis, but the cross trial frequency analysis looks nice. You can get the signals back. So this cross trial analysis is independent of, frequent, uh, of uh, phase shifts and phase incoherence. And that's a really nice thing. So how do I define dynamic ergodicity? I said, okay, if the older time series have the same information, the same dynamics, I don't care again about phase shifts or, or anything, or even if there's instationarities in there, I don't care about it. If the information, the dynamical information in all those time series is the same, then, um, uh, I can, can do this, uh, this dynamic ergodicity and I can do cross trial TDA. So here I have six time series and I compute from each of them, just the A1, A2, A3, as I showed before and the error, the model error. Then I do this for all six of these time series. 
I take the, error, uh, the mean of all these errors. And then I compute the cross trial DDA, again, Legos, or these matrices and uh, derivatives stuck on top of each other and can, can do here one time. So this is the multivariate version. I have my one error uh, uh, row B. So if this error, the mean of these errors should be similar to the error of the, of the cross trial if they have the same dynamical information. So I take the quotient, it should be one if it's perfect. So I, I subtract one and take the absolute value. And this is how I define dynamic locality. I also have a causality measure, so cross dynamic DDA. So let's say you have a system A that, that um, projects to system B. You have, a, uh, you have a time series X of T and a time series Y of T. So if you look at your single trial DDA just from this system X, and you add the terms of the system Y, X has no information about Y. So this term should be irrelevant. It should be random. And this error should be similar. On the other hand, if you take the, um, if you take the time series Y of T, apply your model and get the error, add terms from the other system. So you have here, you have more information. So your fitting error should get better. And this, uh, the difference between these errors should be not similar. So they should be, there should be a difference. Similar, so the, the errors have about the same values. So um, it, it is a similar thing to Granger causality, you know, where you just take terms from the other system and then you look how the error is changing, if your fit gets better or not. So um, I define uh, the causality from Y to X as this, uh, the difference between the upper errors and the causality from X to Y as the difference from the lower values. So let's look at this causality measure. Again, causality only makes sense if these time series are in independent. If they're already synchronized, if they're already synchronized, then of course this model error would also get better. And then you would have a false positive. You would have, you would have a show causality from B to A if, if there is no, no causality. So let's try this. I have two of this. Um, Russell systems, these are the toy, one of the uh, toy systems everybody nonlinear dynamics plays with. It's a nonlinear system, so you have a nonlinear term in the last equation. You have two of the systems, and you diffu diffusively couple the first, first system into the second system. So here you have x1, and here you have the coupling parameter sigma, so this is the coupling strength. So if you then couple and look at this causality measure with no noise and with noise, here is just the attractors, then you see that um, you have the blue is above the red, which is the right connection. Um, magenta is the wrong connection. So, um, but then at some point these two systems synchronize and then you get the wrong answer. If you do it with 10 dB noise, you get even a wronger answer. Excuse me. So then I computed ergodicity between these two systems and multiply ergodicity with causality. Sorry. And then these wrong answers are getting, getting taken away. So I can normalize this causality measure with the ergodicity measure and say, as soon as, um, as this time is more similar, my ergodicity measure should be zero. So if I multiply it, I get a weighted effect. So again, here um, we have now the complete picture. We have the cross dynamic here. I just put the Legos next to each other. So I have, um, I have here the matrices next to each other. And then I looked at the error differences. So how does this, how does DDA, um, uh, how does DDA compare to more traditional analysis? So in more traditional analysis, you have your data, you do have a data pre-processing, usually ICA or other techniques, you get your spectral features, 
um, you do some dimensional reduction and then you get your answer. DDA is a two-step procedure. So first you need to uh, select the model and the delays. So, the, um, so here we can, you can do it with an exhaustive search. Here I also did it with a genetic algorithm. So it's any search algorithm to look for the best fitting model. You can either do it um, unsupervised. So you look just at the lowest model error or the best, uh, best separation between two classes. And for EEG data, this model is always popping out. I tried it for sleep data, I tried it for schizophrenia data, epilepsy data, Parkinson data. It's always comes, this model always comes. The delays are more task specific. So the model is just for one dynamic system. So if I would look at heart data, I would have to choose another model because probably the EG model is not good enough. And I did that and there were more nonlinear models. Um, and then as soon as I have this model, I just apply it. So I take my EG data, do not filter it, just each data window zero mean unit variance. I do not even filter outline noise. I just leave everything in as it is because any, any filtering uh, changes the dynamics of the data. So I do not want the dynamics of the data changed. Then I apply it to my little model and get my answer. And that's it. So for the epilepsy data. Question. Yep. So um, where would be the equivalent of extracting spectral features in the DDA analysis? Yeah, I don't have a, this high dimensional feature space uh, where I do dimensional reduction. I have already a low dimension. I saw first with the structure selection, I select the model that best fits the data. So instead of, of throwing out information later, mm -hmm. I throw out the information before I, I, I put in the data. So then you do the Dimensional reduction on the raw EG data? Yes, the... also on the raw EG data, and I do that just once, and then I apply it, this model. And for epilepsy data, I have different delays than for sleep data, than for Parkinson or schizophrenia. I have, so the delays are really uh, task specific. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that there's a relationship between delays and frequency, right? Maybe there is no relationship, so I don't know. Um, as soon as you have nonlinear signal, the relationship is gone. But it's linear. Maybe. For linear signal, there would be. So for example, for a, a speech, a speech data is a really good example. Um, for vocals, you have a very, very, um, very linear signal, let's say that. And then you can really see the frequencies, cho uh, the delays chosen are really the inverse proportional to the frequencies and you can do form and analysis with that. But that's the only example I found in real data where the frequencies make sense. Because there you really, you see also when you look at the attractor, you see these beautiful shapes which you never ever see in. And then usually data like EEG data are so highly non-stationary. So, you know, you never have a pure sign. You always have frequency couplings and phase couplings. Well, same with spectral analysis. You look at a signal content and you, even without any yeah. fixed frequencies, right? You look at high frequencies, low frequencies. Yeah, yeah, but you have a high dimensional a feature space, you have a lot of frequencies. And then you have to look, okay, do I look in the alpha band or in the beta band or, um, or what frequencies do I really concentrate on? Or you just put your, your spectra into a neural network and see what the neural network is finding. Not sure what the reason for uh, removing ground species? Um, so I don't want to concentrate on amplitude um, because, for example, for epilepsy data during uh, epileptic seizure you, or during artifacts, you have really high amplitudes. And I just want to compare the dynamics of the signal. So for the epilepsy data, I'm collaborating with Sid Cash in Boston and mainly um, work with Paria and Melody. 
So epilepsy is a chronic neurological disease that affects people of all ages. About 50 million people on this planet have epilepsy, so this is a lot of people. Um, it manifests in seizures, which is a sudden breakdown in the neural activity of the brain. And you have alteration of behavior, movement, sensation, and consciousness. Um, if you know anybody with epilepsy, they don't like their medication at all because the epilepsy medications have so many side effects and are not, not good. But there is also so many people who, who take this medication and still get seizures. So the last resort is surgery. And this is where I come in. So out of these 50 million people that have epilepsy, more than half of them have focal epilepsy. And a third of those patients, um, the medication doesn't work. So that's bad. So these people go into a hospital, they, uh, they put electrodes into the brain, they sit in the hospital for three weeks, two, three, four weeks, depending on how long they can leave their let the electrodes be in. And they hope that these people have at least three to five seizures. So this is also not fun. And then they, they resect some brain to hope to find. So it's really crucial to find the onset of the seizures. And if you could find, instead of the onset of the seizures, additional a precursor of the seizure, you probably could implant a brain pacemaker instead of resecting the brain that does something to prevent the seizures to happen. So what I will show the seizure detection, data segmentation, camera states, um, it will apply a causality measure and tell you about seizure prediction. So this is the data I have. Sometimes to put really grid electrodes into the brain on wide areas. Nowadays, the more put deaf electrodes in. So in this, in this example, this patient has two grid electrodes and two deaf electrodes. Today, there's more deaf electrodes than grid electrodes because people recover much faster. So here I had, um, I took 13 patients and 30 minutes before all the seizures, I had about 200 seizures from the 13 patients and 30 minutes after the seizure and just looked for the lowest model error. Uh, I had up to fourth order nonlinearity or the three term models, there's 280 of those. And when these uh, computations were stopped, as did about 1 million data segments, uh, in most of the cases, there were these models chosen. And these models have one thing in common, they have two linear terms and one nonlinear term. Um, when I did this with other EEG data, I got similar results. But two models stick out. This is model 58 and model 62, they bifurcate. They have before the seizure, they, they are not good models. After the seizure and during the seizure, they are good models. So I'm using one of those. It, it doesn't matter which one. One is the quadratic term and one is power four term. For the delay, delays, the same. I looked at the delays, the best chosen delays. There is again bifurcation. So you have delays that are better before a seizure and delays that are better after a seizure. So for the model, I just chose one of these two models. And for the delays, I choose uh, delays that are good before and after the seizure. So here I just plot A1. Remember I had the terms A1, A2, A3, and I just plot A1. I don't do anything with A2 and A3 because that's enough to get all the information. So for this patient, this patient has two, uh, two grids implanted and six deaf electrodes. And if I look at the A1, this is from three minutes before a seizure to five minutes after a seizure. I see this big bump during the seizure. Um, if I do the heat map of this here, where I have here first the first grid, the second grid, and then all the deaf electrodes, I, and I zoom in, I see really nice patterns. So I really see where the seizures start. A clinical seizure is a seizure that is usually one to two minutes and, and manifests in really these behavioral changes. A subclinical seizure is usually less than a half a minute and the patient doesn't, uh, doesn't feel that they have a seizure. It's really hard to detect. DDA can also detect the subclinical seizures, 
but they are, all, they are very localized. So in this case, they are just in two of the electrodes, which is somewhere in this grid. So I can also find stimulation artifacts and interictal. Interictal is just between seizures. So stimulations look completely different. You see these white stripes in the heat maps. Artifacts would be, could, you could, in this picture, you could, um, could say this could be a seizure, but the dynamics is missing. So there is no pattern here. When you looked at the seizure, you had this really distinct patterns. And for artifact, you don't have it. Then you have also these white spots where the data are clipping and I just get none. So I don't have any results for those data segments. Interictal periods um, just look very boring. So in Greek mythology, you have chimeras, which are animals that are composed of multiple animals. In this case, a lion, a goat, and a serpent. And in data analysis, you also have chimera states, which are partial synchronization and partial desynchronization. So in older times, people talked about epilepsy, there is sy complete synchronization. But what about if it, the synchronization is not complete, but this mixed states occur. So we really found, we found chimera states in brain EEG. So this patient has um, five uh, deaf electrodes on the left side and five deaf electrodes on the right side. And the neurologist determined that the onset is here and here. But if I look at the A1, this is four days of recording uh, in the upper picture. I saw around the seizures, I see these very strange patterns and they come nowhere otherwise in the recordings except before the seizures. If I zoom in to 20 hours of data, I again see before each of the seizures, I see this mixed state here. I, I sorted the um, channels, uh, the first 33 channels are the uh, onset channels as determined by the neurologist. And if I do on this DDA features on the A1, the Hilbert transform and look for the faces, I see that I have here really chimera states. So before the seizure here, I have desynchronization in the onset channels and synchronization in the onset channels in the non-onset channels, sorry. And after the seizure, everything is pretty much synchronized. So if I zoom in to one minute before a seizure and two minutes after seizure, and again, plot the faces, I see that before the seizure, I have this nice chimera state. Then they somehow flip flop. And after the seizure, everything synchronizes. I can compute the co-motor order parameter where I just look at the phase distribution. Before the seizure, I have this typical chimera state, then things get more chaotic. And then after they synchronize again. So if I look at the seven seizures in the left pictures, you have 30 minutes before a seizure and 30 minutes after. These seven seizures look very alike. If you look at five minutes before a seizure to five minutes after a seizure, even if you take a closer look, these five seizures look alike. Here, I aligned them to the onset as determined by the neurologist. Why some of the seizures are a little bit delayed, I'm discuss still discussing this MGH about that. Um, neurologists usually determine the seizure onset, they look at the raw data, and then they see some spikes. And you have to use, you have to ask a neurologist, but they just look at the data and then determine the onset. So now I want to use dynamic ergodicity to do dynamic clustering of the brain. Remember, dynamic ergodicity is, is also something which can distinguish the chimera states from the non-chimera channels. Because it doesn't, you know, you, uh, you look for dynamic similarity. So again, um, we have the six time series. And if I look at time series one and two, I can compute my uh, features from that and the error can take the mean. 
I can also take the mean from the first two channels in costile way. Um, remember this multivariate analysis with the Lego stuck on top of each other. And then I get my ergodicity measure. This is a here for this, it's a low, um, it's a low value because you have high dynamic similarity. If you look at uh, channel one and the last, it looks different. And the dynamic ergodicity is also much higher and the similarity is much lower. So you can build by doing this with all the pairwise channels, you can build up a dynamic ergodicity matrix. Of course, this is um, symmetric. This is why I put E12 on both places, not 2-1. Um, I can then use this dynamic ergodicity matrix to compute entropy and entropy or the parameter and do hierarchical clustering. I do this to define brain states and areas. I also used it for ERP decomposition and speech decoding. So if you look at the time series here, the channels are not sorted. Here, the, this little, little bars on the bottom are the onset channels. So here at zero is the seizure onset as determined by the neurologist. So you see that before it looks, looks all the same, then something happens, a little bit of a change, all the onset channels seem to be involved. And then the ergodicity goes down, everything gets more similar to each other. And then you have a different state, a post ictal state. So I'm, I'm applying this entropy from the recurrence toolbox and clustering is just a hierarchical clustering toolbox in MATLAB. And if I do that, I see very nicely before the seizure, here is the onset channels. So they cluster together, not all of them in this chimera state, as soon as the, um, as the seizure is onset, all, this, all, the, uh, all the onset channels are clustered together. And also during the first phase of the seizure, and then they somehow go apart again in different clusters. So here I have this ergodicity matrices. I also have plot here entropy. And again, the entropy goes down, and then I go to another state, which is the post ictal state. And here you see some like fluctuations of this, uh, uh, of this entropy parameter which you couldn't see in the Kuromoto order parameter. Again, here is the clusters. I did not sort them. Um, the, the red bars are the onset channels. And you see red is, is all the onset channels are more in red. Then you have this onset of the seizure, the flip-flopping, and then you go to this post-ictal state. And this, the, you have time in minutes here. So if you compare the DDA feature, which is here, as I showed you before, one minute before a seizure to two minutes after seizure, if you look at the phases, you see already more information. If you look at the Kuramoto order parameter, it goes up because you have here partial synchronization and you here you have complete synchronization. Here is also partial synchronization. But if you look at these clusters and the entropy parameter, you see before the seizure, you see um, these chimera states, then um, it gets more complicated. And then after you have this complete synchronization, so, uh, the, uh, so everything is much more synchronized. Um, I think it's nice to see that in the Kuramoto order parameter, you both are up at one. And here in the entropy, you have a different state in the post, for post-ictal and pre-ictal. So if you look at, um, this is um, 70, um, nearly 80 minutes of data, so a little bit over an hour. This is one seizure, and this is the next seizure. You see that the same exact, so this is the seizure, and this is the post-ictal state, which goes slowly into the pre-ictal state again. And if you look at these two seizures, they look very, very similar. And here you have this chimera state, where you have, it, uh, you have a much higher value than for the entropy than before. And also the clustering looks a little bit different. So you just visually already see that there is different kinds of clusters in the pre-ictal state than in the post-ictal state. 
It looks like when entropy dips, are those then little microseizures? Um, we are looking at this. There is, uh, this is EEG data, they are recorded at 500 hertz. Um, we are looking if there is micro events, I think I see some, mm -hmm. but uh, we are still discussing. So in the literature there is, um, people say there could be micro events, nobody saw them. So I have also recordings with higher sampling rates and I need to, to look at those. So if I look at the A1, from uh, five minutes before seizure to 10 minutes after seizure, here I aligned them to where I see the seizure onset. So you see that they, they look very, very similar. Again, here the, uh, the onset channels are sorted uh, down here. The clusters also look, the cluster analysis looks very, very similar. And the entropy parameter also looks very similar. So this is the seizure. Then it goes down to the real post ictal state, and then you have always the entropy fluctuations till it goes again into this chimera state. So then I looked at causality, and here um, we have again this um, the onset channels um, determined by the neurologists, which are the red parts here and the red part here. So we had this pre-ictal state, which, um, which is this chimera state, if you look here. These chimera states last between 20 minutes and two hours, so pretty long. But you have before, after the post-ictal state is done, you have in all the seizures, this red, blue things. So you have here, the red goes on and the blue goes off. And this blue channel is down in another brain region. So there is some information flow from this brain region to the onset channels. And of course, you know, some patients redevelop seizures. So if you, um, if you would resect um, tissue in the onset region and you have somewhere else where it comes from before the pre-ictal state, these people can redevelop seizures. So right now we are looking also at these patients who came back to the hospital who redeveloped seizures. We have 10 patients of those and compare, the, um, compare these um, states. So in summary, you can, um, you can, uh, can uh, see the chimera stage, partial synchronization states in the brain that can predict epileptic seizures. The seizure onset, onset and the origin might be different. And I'm looking now at over 100 patients, over 2,000 seizures, uh, lots and lots of terabytes of data. So it's nice that also DDA, um, I look only at the A1 coefficient. So basically, my algorithm also compresses the data. So I don't have a much, much smaller feature space than I have original in original data. And I can, um, so if I have recording from a patient, like two weeks recording 500, um, 500 hertz sampling rate and 150 channels, uh, I can do that in a day, which is pretty fast. So um, I would like to thank the Chaos Group. Here's everybody, of course, in times of pandemic, there's Zoom meetings. And um, Terry, he, he has been amazing. Sid Cash uh, is also, I work with Sid Cash. Oh, I put here Greg Light. I'm uh, working with him on a schizophrenia project. I didn't take his name out of the last slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, some people are using other methods to uh, localize the seizures and, and predict them. If you just say that your method works better, uh, can you look at how this uh, feature A1 evolved in the space, in future space that other people use? Like, is yeah, there some information on what this means? What I compared my method in 2016. Um, at the, the Kegel competition, so there was a Kegel competition mm -hmm. and 500, uh, 500 teams competed and I got in the top 1%. So no, no, I, I'm not asking about the performance, I'm asking if there are some 
way of getting intuition what does a1 mean by looking at how it evolved in the space let's say principal component analysis yeah i'm sure principal component analysis fails but but at least it allows me to get intuition so um people often use equipment methods but since these methods are usually so high dimensional they always concentrate the potential to be towards zero onsets to zero onsets and not two hours before so within these 10 seconds my my teachers um telling them similar things what they see but i really like to do the analysis on on really before recording so this are these states just only before seizures or are they everywhere else in there and most of the other techniques are high dimensional and very slow um so Melody is using recurrence block analysis where she also looks at this um um if there is a critical state but she only looks like 10, 10 seconds before a seizure to seizure onset so um it's it's hard to compare to other methods but yes in, in, in with the people in boston they have my codes they're using them and we constantly compare things it looks like we have a question in the chat um, from Marie, who will be giving the chat up next week. So, Marie, you want to uh, speak up and look yourself, or, or you want us to read your question? Hi, Hello? Yeah. Hi, Marie. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, I was wondering so, I was wondering about the underlying mechanisms um, linking these uh, pre uh, pre uh, seizure uh, signals to the chimera states to the um, um, so essentially on the topic of how chimera states can predict seizures. Could you elaborate on kind of the underlying physical mechanisms? Is that well um, is a complete mystery or? So there, there was was long discussions about you know synchrony, how is synchrony uh, connected to um, to epilepsy, and we were actually very very happy that we found these chimera states before the seizures. Um, the mechanisms we're still talking with the people in Boston, and right now I I, I don't know too much about it. Okay, thanks. So we found these chimera states like a year ago and we were or two years ago and we we're really happy and now we are we're looking at all these different things okay how why does this chimera state occur here and how uh, so they look at the raw data and they look at the different channels that are involved and um so i found meanwhile chimera states in about 10 15 patients and this is a lot of data to look at. So I constantly sent them, sent them plots and sent them MATLAB files and say, can you look at it? And can you make sense of what I'm doing? And uh, we have a, week, a bi weekly meeting. And up to now, um, they are still looking at it. Thanks. Can so the time delay, yeah, the time delay. So um, you can do it. Um, you can do it in a supervised or unsupervised way. So, for example, um, unsupervised, I just I just take random segments from the signal. If I have two states, I take uh, uh, data from two different states. Or if I have a disease like schizophrenia or something, I take two segments from two different conditions. And then I look at the minimum error. And um, the delay is usually in the undisturbed, uh, either in the undisturbed state, I use those delays, because they shouldn't be good delays for the disturbed state. Or in this case, I just the delays were nicely bifurcating, I just used one delay and the other delay I tried also the delays so at, at the beginning i had eight different delay pairs as candidates uh, some that were good before some that were good after and and then this combination and this combination delays just was the best 
So I'm just then usually just trying which one has the best performance. Across the patients, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I never update the delays. Um, usually for the chimera states, I have different delays for different people. So I already found chimera states for 15 people. But again, I find clusters of delays that work. So for some of the patients, these delays work better than some of this. So there's like three different delays that combine. And now the question is, if I find, so I have to go to more patients, I have 100 pa over 100 patients. So if I find chimera states in like 50, and they group into two or three groups with the delays, can the, can the people in, in, in Boston find any similarity between those patients? So, don't know. For, um, for epilepsy, I'll just use A1. Um, first, uh, I was also looking um, at all the features. The other ones did not have that much information. So sometimes I combine them. So if I do a supervised, I do a cross validation to go on uh, uh, exhaustive search on the whole delay space goes pretty fast. And then I just combine this, uh, the four features to a single measure. Um, this is usually how I start. And sometimes I then compare with the A1, A2, A3, and sometimes one of these features falls out and has all the information. And it, it, this is, is, it, of, is it usually the linear term? No, it's not. Um, so for uh, for sleep, it's also the A1 term. For um, for ERPs, for schizophrenia, um, it's the A3 term. Oh. And uh, 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 don't be confused. The linear term is not the linear term and the nonlinear the nonlinear term. So if you look at the equation and if you would do some dual Walker expansion to come uh, to solve for a one, a two, a three, a one has nonlinear moments in there, a two has nonlinear moments, and a three has linear terms. So if everything is just combined as soon as you have, and this is the I think advantage of having these nonlinear terms in in traditional. Uh, um, delay uh, 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 any um, embedding analysis, you have never quadratic or nonlinear terms. And I think this, this makes it as we still, I'm still discussing with my more mathematically uh, nonlinear friends about if this is an embedding or not. But I just say, okay, the motivation comes from embeddings. More questions for the audience? I have a final question. Which is, yeah. So you had, when you were looking at the full box, you had that blue region that was all, so you had the seizure, and then you had the post typical state. But then you like, that, that, first, that blue burst is always about the same. The same way. Here? Um, I think a little bit for, um, I'm reading about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, we'll see you next week. And if you get it, you're here, you get seats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.